we are at a point in time where we have to right the ship and that we have to educate and, and create a critical mass again of consumers and, and uh, farmers, young farmers and older farmers that understand that this movement, if it's going to have legs in the future and if it's going to support the kind of agriculture we want, really has to have a body of activists there. Consumers can't just be consumers. They actually have to be active in creating the, the food system that they want to see there, which means more than just purchasing the product. It means being engaged and making sure that you're, you're donating to the, to the right kind of agriculture, that you're um, um, uh, getting to know your farmers at the local farmer's market and being concerned about their well-being. Um, it's, it's absolutely essential that we build, rebuild a movement that was successful. And so everybody kind of rested and said, well, we've done our work, but there's yeah. a lot more work to do. That's right. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of the Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an ad on organic food label, distinguishing soil-grown crops and pasture-raised livestock under the organic seal. You just heard from Paul Muller of California's Full Belly Farm, calling on consumers to join together with farmers and help reclaim the organic movement that was built decades ago. In this conversation with my co-director, Dave Chapman, Paul speaks a lot about farmer activism and what else is needed to keep the organic label meaningful since it's our society's best hope for a healthy future. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast, and I am talking today with my friend Paul Muller of Full Belly Farm. And I just had a spectacularly wonderful visit at Full Belly for several days I'm out here in California. So, Paul, welcome. Well, thank you. It's a great honor to be here. Um, we've had a lot of conversations in the in the last couple of days. Uh -huh. um, how are you feeling right now about the Real Organic Project? Because that's a lot of what we were talking about. Uh -huh. Well, I am, I'm feeling positive. I'm feeling really like we're on a trajectory that is a, um, a critical trajectory for takeoff. If you look at how many years it's been around and the number of hours that have been dedicated by farmers and, and, uh, and store owners and researchers to um, to this project, I think we have um, one a, a lot of a lot of smarts that are that are pulling this together. Two, I think we hits resonating. We have farmers who understand what we're doing and they're buying into this idea that we need to protect something that we've put together as a collective kind of a, um, society wide. Um, idea that our food system can be healthier and that we can be connected to a much deeper relationship with farms uh, and, and, and our land that we're farming. Um, so I think our trajectory is really positive. Um, I feel like it's a, it's a monumental task whenever you look at all the forces that are out there perhaps aligned against your efforts. Um, but I'm, I, I think the trajectory is a lot the same um, as the organic movement in its early inception. Um, that we have dedicated people who believe deeply in, in something that makes implicit intuitive sense and others will see that sensibility as the idea spread. So yeah. I think pretty positive. Yeah. It was exciting uh, at, at the gathering last night at Full Belly. There were 30 plus farmers and uh, I loved it was from people who were pioneers many years ago to to you know some young people who are heavily tattooed uh -huh, and, uh -huh, and sure, uh, sure. you know all in though yeah right everybody was yeah, all in yeah um it's important to remember that organic is not the property of just old people nor of young people it's it's it affects all of us yeah you know we i, I think that uh, those who've been around it for a while have to understand that not everybody jumps into it on knowing what you know um knowing what you've experienced and we talked a bit about the need for people getting into um, farming who need to fail a bit at times, need to try things that don't work. And so they really learn the lesson of what does work. And you learn that when you are, when your decisions are on the line and you are, um, in fact, putting yourself in the seat 
in that seat where you um, you have something at risk when you make a decision. So, so you know, we have, um, I think the discussion last night w w involved people who've been around for a long time. And it's pretty critical that they learn how to, to kind of delicately transfer that knowledge to people who want to learn. And it's really important, I think, we have a lot of young farmers who don't ever ask. You know, they don't say, well, how did this happen? You know, how did organic come about? Um, and if they don't get that, then it's just, it's like it's always been here. But it was, in fact, an effort of, of um, I think it was a, a, a moment in time when consciousness was ready for it, when the, the issues that arose when the conversation around Silent Spring and Rachel Carson's book and um, the elevating of a consciousness, just as we are maybe now have an elevating a consciousness about race and about the history of race. Um, and it's becoming something that everyone at this moment is becoming drawn into a conversation and, and needing to look inside. So it happened with, with our food system, and that was the organic movement. I really feel like it is one of the more significant, you know, kind of community-driven, farmer-driven, grassroots-driven um, initiatives that's happened in our country in the last 50 years, in that um, it wasn't supported by, you know, large universities. I mean, it's, there, it's an amazing story, I think, of how organic has grown. Um, into being a major force now in the food food industry and uh, in, in what consumers choose when they go to go to a store and it hasn't probably reached all parts of the country but um, from our perspective here in California it is it is the mark of a um, of a produce department to say they have organic produce they're doing the advertising for us they are the ones who are building the the uh, momentum in the industry by um, inferring and, and knowing that it's a higher standard, that it's food that you can trust in terms of its uh, exposure to toxic pesticides or um, what it's been doing for the environment and, and what an organic farm is supposed to be. And I think there's an archetype that people might end up having about what organic agriculture is and why, why they're supporting it. But it certainly has momentum here that has a history. And sometimes you only see the history that of the pieces that are right around you. And I, so I think there are a lot of young farmers and consumers who don't know um, how this has been a, um, a movement that it took place because it, there was an idea that resonated back in the 60s and 70s. And it resonated in that, the idea that we can take control of our food system, that we can take the toxins out of our food system, that we can... Um, build closer relationships with, as consumers and farmers and farming communities with one another, um, that our food can come from a trusted source, um, and we could um, certify that food as being um, pesticide-free and farmed with uh, the right intention. And so that history was an, a laborious process of a lot of meetings, and I've done a, quite a few meetings in my life, and I'm sure you have too. Yeah. But it's, it was a laborious process of many, many, many meetings all over the country, not just here, right. not just in our community. But it was a something that was like a leavening of an idea that rose up, made sense, um, and people grabbed onto it. I think that's where a little bit where the ROP, the Real, Real Organic Project, is right now. There's something that makes eminent sense, and people will gravitate toward it and support it. So one of the things, one of the things that we've all been talking about um, for the last four days or so is the significance of organic sort of getting back its its roots as a movement, as something with velocity, as something with uh, a large group of people moving in a common direction. Something that I think was a bit lost. And it had become a business, a brand. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I, I, we all work at farming to make a living. I, I'm not against that at all. But uh, I, as I said earlier, it seems that there's a problem if you've got someone who's a certified organic farmer and you open the refrigerator and nothing's organic in there. So as something that we believe in and uh, in response to an ongoing problem, and I think, you know, that the challenge is still there. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, as, as a movement, you need 
lots of pieces um, to come together to make a movement cohesive and um, forceful. And it is uh, organic agriculture, organic farmers would not have succeeded without organic consumers and a small cadre of researchers that that were looking at the right questions and, and uh, helping farmers find answers to, you know, kind of fundamental processes. When I first began, I grew up on a dairy farm and uh, my family farms, you know, this idea of farming organically was like, what do you want to do? You know, I mean, the culture of using different products to deal with certain pro problems um, was baked in. I mean, that's just what farmers did. And to think that you could do it without it, that you could go ahead and grow food without synthetic nitrogen fertilizer by using cover crops and building soil and getting biological systems working. Um, and you could get away from herbicides and by dealing with timing and, and technique and, and learning how and understanding how you deal with weeds before they become a problem. Um, and you could deal with um, problems of, of, of uh, pest issues by thinking uh, holistically about how you grow beneficial insects there, how you, you interplant or you use cropping thinking, cropping pattern thinking in order to forestall you know, the problems that, that might arise from insects. That was all foreign. It was all like, oh, well, good luck. You, you know, if you want to starve, that's what you'll do. And the, the proof, I mean, the reason why we farm at the scale we farm is because we wanted farmers to see that it wasn't just an idea, that you can farm at this scale, make a living, and we farm about 500 acres, um, but it's in cover crop, and it's, there's some in pasture, and there's some in, in uh, um, uh, crops that were actively growing and crops that were harvesting. So it's being, being moved over, over cropping rotation over a long period of time. Um, but to show growers that this is actually feasible, it's not a pie in the sky idea. Yeah. And so that, 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 that knowledge is, um, was supported by all levels, um, you know, in, 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 ter in, in terms of enlightened consumers who said, this is the kind of agriculture you want. Um, in terms of enlightened researchers who said, I'm going to help out with this and we're going to look for biological solutions to, to problems that were heretofore dealt with chemically. Um, to a social scientist who said we need to think about alternative food movements and, and we're going to support that, to co-ops, to, to all the pieces that came together to build the organic movement. And the history is a critical one. Yeah. The history is important. Yeah. I mean, it's important for us as, um, and I'm you know, beginning to be an older farmer, um, to be able to relate to, to younger farmers that as farmers, the idea of an activist farmers goes back to people who understood that you simply can't expect the movement to, to, be, to go in the right direction all the time. You, you can't stop thinking that you have to pay attention because your certifier is taking care of things and they're the ones doing the political work. Um, certifiers can get it wrong. Um, and maybe not direct the ship in the right in the right way because they're enamored maybe with growing bigger, and they make compromises. Um, so um, this idea that um, we are at a point in time where we have to right the ship and that we have to educate and, and create a critical mass again of consumers and and uh, farmers, young farmers and older farmers that understand that this movement, if it's going to have legs in the future and if it's going to support kind of agriculture we want really has to have a body of activists there. Consumers can't just be consumers. They actually have to be active in creating the, the food system that they want to see there, which means more than just purchasing the product. It means being engaged and making sure that you're, you're donating to the, to the right kind of agriculture, that you're um, um, uh, getting to know your farmers at a local farmer's market and being concerned about their well-being. Um, it's, it's absolutely essential that we build, rebuild a movement that was successful. And so everybody kind of rested and said, well, we've done our work, but yeah. there's a lot more work to do. That's right. Uh, Will Allen said to me once, we thought we'd won, but we haven't won yet. It's, yeah. it's ongoing. Yeah, winning is, is actually um, a continuum of effort, yes. right? It's not just, there's not the end of the game. That's right. It might even be the wrong word. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, we, we need to think in terms of yeah. moving towards a, a desired pattern, a desired relationship. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
And so that's not a either or. And it's not just a farming question. It yeah. is really a question of association with um, the planet, with with the with the earth, with all the functions of what we expect to be there. Um, whether it's fossil fuels or um, um, in California right now we have a drought. Whether it's it's taking for granted the abundance of water in a state that has a good part of it as desert. Um, it's it's understanding our relationship to the whole and in whatever part of, of society you live in and uh, and being active in the creation of something that is not a fearful future or not a not a future beset with um, um, doubt and uh, anxiety but it's a, a positive future that's healthy and um, vibrant and, and it's here we just have to figure out how we modify our behavior and our understanding and appreciation of it we can make it happen yeah yeah one thing you said last night to those 30 farmers that uh, I thought was important was that farmers can't do this alone. There have been great farmer movements and, you know, when was the 80s, the big tractor rally, and it was, it was really impressive. I can't remember, but they had like a thousand tractors going into Washington, D.C. Easily, yeah. And nothing changed. Right. It was an amazing event, but nothing changed. And... What they were missing was, you know, 100,000 people, eaters, marching with them. Yeah, the, I mean, if you just look at the 60s where, you know, I was a, I was a young, young kid there and graduated from high school in 1971. But if you look at the, the farm, farm unrest of the 60s, um, it, was, it was farmers who were um, uh, dumping milk in the streets. And they were... Um, tractor cage to Washington, D.C. I mean, it was, it was at their point, the last ditch effort to save a scale of agriculture, which was, um, in their opinion, um, the right scale, kind of a human scale. Um, and that was when there was a National Farmers Organization, a National Farmers Union. Um, and so those organizations still existed, but in fact, the, <laughs> the prevailing economic thinking at the time was that we have too many farmers. You know, we need those. That, that was the economic thinking that the farm, the farm problem is that we have excess human resources in agriculture. And I think it was a, a grave, grave mistake, you know, in terms of our thinking economically and socially. And then the political um, programs that evolved from that, because I think that you need the hand of a farmer to, to truly steward land and understand what a place is and how to make it fruitful. and how to tend it well. Um, and in fact, the direction of most of industrial agriculture has been, let's eliminate people. Now let's put computers there. Let's put f the farmer at the driver's seat of a computer where they they have driverless tractors out there that are, that are mapping things. Wonderful, intelligent, smart systems, but they are not systems of stewardship. They are systems of, of seeing your land through the lens of a computer and a screen that tells you, how many tons of corn you're getting per acre. You know, that's how you judge your land yeah. rather than the intimate relationship with the place. It, it seems like that really kind of got started with Earl Butts, Secretary of Agriculture. I mean, there was that, that sure. he really had a vision to change agriculture and it was basically get rid of an awful lot of farmers and make it an industrial process. Right. Well, it was, you know, that he was, Butts, Butts was the Secretary of Agriculture during, um, well, Reagan's administration, right? Um, um, or Nixon. was it Nixon? And then, and then, well, so he was kind of mid to late seventies yeah. when he said, "Get big or get out." Yeah. Um, it was the problem was, I mean, we had a demographic shift in this country that was was profound. I mean, the number of people leaving rural areas and leaving agriculture. His his prescription was um, with the Russian wheat deal and with yeah. selling grain to a, an expanding world market. Is that the potential? of American agriculture is limitless. Let's push it out, you know, produce fence row to fence row. And it spawned one of the major um, agriculture depressions in the early 80s where farmers were killing themselves because they'd gone out and they lived the prescription and they were invested deeply in, in going fence row to fence row as they said farmers should plant. Yeah. And they tore down the dwellings of their neighbors' farmers when they can acquire that land. And, you know, so it was a, um, a deconstruction that was profound and, and, and uh, 
it was Earl Butts was just the manifestation of that and yeah. created a huge agricultural That's right. depression. That's right. So uh, let's talk about scale just a little bit. Uh -huh. It's such a complicated question, sure, I, I sure think. And, and, you know, the Real Organic Project talks about it quite a lot, too. Uh, you have interesting ideas for me. Could you share some of your thoughts about the relationship of small farms to mid-scale farms to large farms and that perhaps they all have a place in the ecosystem? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I think anyone who's, who's made a living in farming is currently in farming is, is something of a, of a, of a, a hero to me because it, it's, it's been a hard road to make a, make a living in farming. Very, very difficult, and um, that uh, um, it, it, there's a huge market out there. And so for farmers who are, one, growing things, they're, they're survivors, and so there's part of me that admires that and feels a kinship to that. Um, there is, um, for, for farmers of scale who are farming organically, there's a huge market out there that they're feeding. So there's part of me that feels like that's a major improvement over large farms that farm uh, with a chemical process. It's a major step forward to say we've removed these toxins. And I think in, even though a lot of that, you can, might be critical of some of the ways they farm, I think the system itself, the ecology of the things you learn when you farm organically, you start asking wholly different questions. And you ask questions about how do, do soil systems work best? How do I feed this biology? You know, how do I create more here than just a growing crop? And it, it, the system itself leads people to, to more complicated and more um, sustainable answers. So I think that a lot of those farms will be there. So larger organic farms are, are on a pathway to understanding soil systems and whole farm thinking because it's inevitable, I think. They end up asking the right questions. Um, so, and, and I deeply believe in the power of the, the, the social power of having small farms and having people who are stewarding the land that they live on, who are feeding local food systems, who are um, um, building this, the social fabric of rural America, which has been kind of torn up. Um, I really believe deeply that they are a force in our democracy that is, um, has been forsaken a bit. Uh, hasn't had a balance. Um, most of the, my peers, when I went to school, were told by their parents who farmed, you know, get out, get far away from this as you can, sell real estate, go into banking, do something different than farming. Because it was a history of failure and uh, very thin margins and, and surviving. So um, I, I do think that there is a, a place for those different scales. The Real Organic Project, um, I think there is, is grappling with that because I think um, the small farmers who are attracted to this understand that we, they need a champion. They need a place where if their interests are going to be heard, um, it's going to be taken, taken by belonging or, or promoted by belonging with other farmers to something that becomes akin to a movement and um, absolutely necessary. And for me, that's a big reason why I'm part of the Real Organic Project. It is a it is an attempt to reclaim a place in this social fabric where organics was a shelter for, yeah. for small, um, mid-scale farmers, where they could get into a marketplace that was only driven by price, where the values of uh, tending your land well and creating a deeper, more complex ecology were not recognized. And hence, if they're not recognized, they weren't rewarded. And so um, uh, that, that's what you know, organic agriculture carved out was a place where prices were, were fairly given to people who were doing the right thing on their land. They were people who were buying produce, were looking at cheaper apples that were grown conventionally, but choosing the organic apple that might be more expensive because they felt yeah. that farmer was doing something right. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I tend to have empathy for lots of different scales. Yeah. Um, I also have empathy for farmers who are, who are now pursuing regenerative agriculture. And I know that's a really difficult one because there are no standards about, around regenerative agriculture. Organic has had 50 years of putting pieces in place that determine the legal boundaries, the, the, um, the technical boundaries, um, the products that you can use, the, the legislation and, and the, the branding, you know, and what the, 
what the parameters there are. The 50 years of quitting that altogether. And regenerative has, you know, as a word out there that anybody can use. But um, we are at a point in time when we need kind of all hands on deck, talking about how do we heal a planet. And if, if, if there's a label that brings farmers who are conventional farmers into a place where they're asking new questions, and they be questions that are fundamental, what's soil health all about? You know, how do I get away with, with, with using less uh, nitrogen fertilizers that may be, um, you know, infiltrating an aquifer that's going to poison my grandkids and they, where they can't drink this water? They're asking new questions, and the questions are critical that we ask them right now. Yeah. Wait, not a moment, moment, to, moment to spare. Not a moment to spare. So, um, just this week, uh, 90 farms in New England got dropped by Denone... Uh, then on Horizon Dairy, and uh, basically all the farms in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine that were contracting to sell milk to, I think, the largest organic dairy in America. And, uh, you know, we're trying to make sense of that. Of course, it's a, a terrible thing for all of us, most terrible for the people who own those farms. Um, and. You know, the reason I got pushed out was because Danone can get the milk cheaper yeah. from a CAFO yeah. out west. Yeah. you have anything you wanted to say about that? I, it's, a, it's a painful one, I know. Well, you know, I mean, first of all, it's a tragedy. And it's a tragedy that someone like Danone can, cannot see that as a, a public benefit corporation. That public benefit goes beyond their bottom line and really go, goes to how they're invested in their whole supply chain. And, they're, if, and you know, it's a tragedy because there is no better union, in my opinion, than someone taking care of rolling hills with cows who are grazing them, producing a product that's pure as milk, you know, marketing that, that regionally and put, putting that into the supply chain in a really healthy system. Cows were meant to eat grass. That's what their rumens are for. That's how they're built. And cows were meant to walk to that grass and browse. And if you manage that as a farmer, you have this amazing relationship, you know, amazingly highly evolved relationship with a species that was domesticated, that you're caring for, that you are, um, you are, um, know the genetics of, that you've taken mothers and generations of cows to, to, to have the cows that you have in this amazing relationship where they give you milk every day. They provide you with something that is a, you know, for some people can't drink milk, but it's an amazingly pure food. Um, that's a wonderful, profound relationship that some folks, either there, there are people who disagree with that relationship, who believe that animals are treated inhumanely in those systems, but it's not true at all. But I think these farms really know that their cows are their lifeblood and that they're perfectly matched to the place that they're living in. So it's a tragedy that a company like Danone can say, it's price. It's, I can get it cheaper. Um, I can get it cheaper from someone who's purporting to be organic. And it's a, a, exactly the point that a Real Organic Project is aiming at, is that if there's going to be credibility in this system, if the archetypical farms that we're really building our image around where we're when we drink that glass of milk, this is where this milk is coming from. If that's going to be true, then it needs people to be invested Consumers to be invested in making sure that's true. And it's not just the USDA stamp anymore because the USDA is capitulating and allowing those systems to be certified as organic. And they, they shouldn't. But they're not policing. They're, they're, they're our, we handed that, that word of organic over to them, and they're not policing that word. They're not uh, being responsible to everyone who believes in organic by allowing less than organic systems to compete and put those, those farms out of business. Yeah. So there's a tragedy there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and one of the things it demonstrates is that there really are no local food systems anymore, that the, the reason that those Vermont farmers are threatened is, and the Maine farmers and the New Hampshire farmers and the New York farmers, is because of milk coming from Texas, right. ultra-pasteurized. So you can't say, and this is something I've been working on, is like, we can't say just things are pretty good here. I think I, I go to some places in California. I was in Mill Valley two days ago and talk about a community that cares. And I walked into the Whole Foods and the organic tomatoes were hydroponic tomatoes from Ontario. Right. And it's the height of tomato season. That's Ontario, Canada. 
<laughs> to Ontario, Canada. Shipped to California. That's right. At the height of our season here. Right. Yeah, you know, I, um, the, I, I think that the tragedy is that um, you can grow things in greenhouses and they can be cheaper. And fuel price will say, well, I can ship them to California at this cost. Um, now you've just, just taken a, a tomato, grown it in a, in a pretty sterile environment. Um, you can grow abundance there. That's, that's great. It's a technology that uses no, uses no soil. So it has none of that biology underneath that plant that's supporting its, its very intrinsic nature of, of the micronutrients and, the, and the, um, all the uh, proteins and amino acids that can be formed you know, from this healthy soil relationship. Um, and that's shown that those, it's not the same food. Um, and the price of fuel being what it is, well, you're going to put tomato producers out, in Cali out, of, out of business in California because they can't compete. Or Whole Foods is not discerning enough to say, this is a hothouse tomato. It's not what we want to be selling uh, in the peak of California's tomato season. Um, and it's just like milk in New England. It costs more to produce milk there and to have cows there. And so it's a failure on so many levels. The so people of New England should rise up and say, Dan, and we will not buy another ounce of your product unless you're buying it from our farmers up here yeah. because they're the keepers of our landscape. And the whole food shopper should say, where are these tomatoes from? Are they grown um, in the ground? Are they grown regionally here? Do they, how many few food miles are attached to these tomatoes? And whole food should hang their head in shame by, by allowing that to be what enters their supply chain right now. Um, and, and or with, whether it's in, in the Midwest, at a Whole Foods in the Midwest, or a Whole Foods in Texas, or a Whole Foods in Florida, um, those things should be sourced, first of all, from regional economy. And it's good for the whole regional economy. It's, it's good for keeping a continuum of production, and it's a more resilient system. I mean, what happens when fuel gets to $7 a gallon, and suddenly that milk from Texas is going to cost um, way more than it does now? Because it's all based on cheap fossil fuels, and that's the equation that they're that they're throwing out there. And those farms will be gone once you sell your cows. You've sold your history, your genetics, your, you know, all the pieces you put into place. The the milk parlor. I mean, this it, it's not just an investment that happens, boom, over one year. It's a lifetime, or many lifetimes, often, of yeah. investment. Yeah. And you're watching that disappear. Yeah. And people don't know how long it takes to assemble that. Um, it's not, it's not like a car dealership. It's not like a, uh, you know, a, a, a well-funded, uh, chain of stores that can come in and put a store up and close it when they want to. No, it's, it's a human investment in place that, um, so easily disregarded. Um, and so, yeah, there's a shame there. And that cheap milk from Texas is only cheap as long as fossil fuels are cheap, you know, and as long as there's water in Texas. And as long as, you know, where they can water their cows, they have a big drought, suddenly that milk is not going to be there. So where, where are you going to get your milk in New England? And, and I would suggest, I believe that milk is genuinely worth less. It's right. cheaper because it has less value. Well, I mean, it's, it's, you can look at the, the science about cows on good grass. And, you know, I mean, you think, think about it, there is a science to growing good grass. There is a science to having a well-maintained pasture. You know, it, I like the idea that pasture can be your pharmacy and the cows know what to eat in order to have to maintain their health. And as farmers, good dairymen know that their pasture is going to be diverse, multitude of species, multitude, many, many layers of, of life there, you know, from broadleaf clovers and, and other forbs to, to um, you know, grasses and things. So they, they build a pharmacy out there for the cows to be healthy. Yeah. You know, and um, that's not what's happening in Texas. They they put they put cows in confinement like situations. They don't have the water to grow the pasture that's being grown in New England or Wisconsin or Upper Midwest um, or even California. They don't have the money and the water to do that, so the cows don't get pasture. It's just because it's it's dry down there. It's um, because they can milk cows 365 days of the year. Um, um, it's because they um, have access to cheap feed, you know, flow, flowing down from the Midwest, um, that they can do those things. And there's no regionality, no, no long-term um, resiliency in allowing that to continue. So the USDA has let us down. Yeah. You know? And you know, it's, it's time that consumers and stores and others write to Dana and say, don't do this. 
those are those are valuable regional resources don't let them go yeah i actually think also a lot of that cheap feed is not coming from the midwest it's coming from turkey ukraine you know uh places far far away very dubious origins in terms of actually being organic but 70 75 percent of this organic soy sold in america comes from out of the country and almost 50 percent of the corn so it's a complicated world um listen before we go paul i would like to have you talk a bit you, you know uh, I've been so impressed in California to see the level of innovation of established farms who are still asking deep questions and going, is there a better way? You know, how do we do this better? And, and I know that you're one of a group who has been working on the question of no-till in vegetables. So this is something for our friends listening who are vegetable farmers uh-huh. or, or vegetable uh-huh. gardeners. And um, what are you learning? And, let, you know, let's set aside good or bad. Um, we, we, we know that there could be a, a value to, to no-till. And we also know that, well, some of us know there are a lot of problems with it. Yeah. People talk about no-till, and what they're really talking about is livestock farming. I don't know that they necessarily digest yeah, that. We have but, cattle in the system, or they're growing crop, crops like um, um, corn or soy. A lot of the no-till, you know, right. conventional yes. no-till uses a lot of herbicides. A lot, so, a lot, a lot of and, um, and, you know, there's even some organic farmers who are saying, well, if I could just get a herbicide in here, I could just, I could do this too, you know. And um, so, but that's not the solution that we're looking at. And, and so a few things that are e- readily observable. When you, when you stop tilling, your soil changes structure and character. Um, it, uh, um, you're still involved in the process. We grow a lot of cover crops. Um, the cover crops can be tilled into the soil and you are managing a certain level of decomposition that happens. Uh, the decomposition is driven by bacteria that consume all of that green material. They live, die, they, they're, they're, um, their very being become the food for the, the, the whole micro life, a whole long chain system. Um, so we can, we can feed that system with the cover crops that we're doing. We've been going along doing that for quite a while, but in that, manipulation there's been some tillage so we're trying rolling down we're trying uh, mowing and splitting and um, we're trying to keep the ground covered because that's the state it wants to be in Um, but it's difficult Um, we uh, you know we've tried a lot of different things this year and I'd have to say that we've had some some what I think are wonderful successes um, where we we see um, for example sweet corn that was um, was able to withstand high high temperatures we had some 112 degree days when that sweet corn was pollinating and it, it pollinated well and it would have done that at been a tilled field i don't think uh, we've where we've had that, that problem before um, we've seen a good plant response to to not tilling and adding things on the top of the ground and feeding from the top down um, we've also had problems we have grown a lot of gophers this last year in, in some of our crops and we've lost some tender crops like melons that don't come roaring out of the ground like corn or beans or, or um, uh, winter squash, hard squash or summer squash. So um, um, it's been challenging and we've adjusted as we've gone. But we've, I really feel like when you, when you look at the, the, the character of the soil, you can actually feel a difference when you take away the tillage tools um, and you begin to think, ask again a new set of questions and the questions are how would i do this without chemicals how would i do this with uh, the tools that i have in modifying a system um, we haven't done a lot of transplanting directly into into um, uh, um, a bed that has a cover that was mown we do have eggplant and and, and some peppers and some uh, tomatoes that were done that way um, and so we're still learning but the idea is that we are constantly uh, blown away, let's say, by all the things you can observe on a farm like this and by all the potentials and the things that we don't know. It's a humbling, humbling uh, profession when you start looking at the complexity of life here and how our job as farmers is to grow good food while not screwing things up. 
<laughs> That's just exactly what Alice Waters said her job was as a chef, uh -huh. was to use the best ingredients she could and then not screw it up in well, the kitchen. Well, there's, there's a parallel there. Yeah, that's right. I didn't know she'd said that, but that's, but that, that's right. It's, um, and then how can you, um, well, how, many, how much more life can you in, introduce into the whole system? So when you don't till, you actually have this, um, I think your fungal populations begin to go up. Now, fungal populations around root systems are their foragers. And when you have drought conditions, the, the fungal populations do a better job of collecting you know, nighttime moisture and bringing it down and, and distributing that and bringing it back up to the plant when the plant needs it. So you're building resilience. You know, uh, with fung high fungal populations, you have roots that are out there and have a, a colony colonized by, by a foraging system of... of um, of hyphae that are out there bringing in nutrients, breaking, putting us, I know, very light acids around complex minerals and breaking down and bringing them in. I mean, they're, they're, they're in this intimate relationship, two-way relationship with, with the plant above ground. And um, it, they may be, so one, one researcher I heard talk with one time said, they may be the intelligence in the whole system is the yeah. fungal life. Yeah. Because it's, it's, a, it's in a complex, um, relationship that has evolved over 50 million or more years since, you know, grassland ecologies uh, grew up in, on the planet. And, uh, and it's pretty wise. It's figured it out. And, and in most of agri most agriculture, we till, we do that um, because it's, it's bare ground is pretty easy to play with. Um, ground that is, has cover on it that you're looking to move the cover and put a plant in there is a little more complicated. But it's, it's just a matter of time before we find the tools to do it organically. Yeah. And some the farmers are going to show how to do it, and, we, and then we'll all learn from them. Yeah. But it's the right approach. Okay. That's, that's good to hear. You know, I know, I know that there were real problems. I, I was visiting Scott Park, and uh -huh. he, he, you know, takes it very seriously uh -huh. and has got these huge trials and swaths. And I have to say the swath that was tilled was yeah. a, a lot better. Yeah. And so as a, as a commercial producer, and he said, yeah, I lost a lot of money when I, I went too big yeah. on a trial. Yeah. And I, I need to do more learning before I, I scale up on that. Right. Well, you know, agriculture in California is a little different. We are, um, we're very hot in the summer. You know, and if you don't have water and the right amount of water and good water, um, you're challenged with an ecology that really is a, more of a desert ecology. It's, it's, it's senescing in the summer for the yes. most part. In a, in a native ecology, an oak woodland or whatever. Um, so so um, this idea of stimulating your soil by, by tilling and working in this um, carbonaceous material is part, of, is part of a long chain, a long process. So good organic farmers have been doing that for a long time. And they're living on the capital of last year's contribution and the year before his contribution. So it is a long chain of, of relation. And you continue to feed that. I think you get the benefits from it. Um, there is, a, though, a body of, of and, and we've seen, seen the same thing at times, that we can, we can uh, till a bit and, and um, aerate the soil, and you're going to get this, this flush of energy, and the energy is what will, you know, make plants green in this organic system. But um, I can feel a difference in, in the soil that I work with when we, when we take a step back and don't till. There's a, there's a physical difference. There is a... Uh, uh, a, a difference in in how it responds to to seed and moisture and it's it's a different process and and so it's it's we're still learning if you can be caught in the middle there and be halfway between one and halfway between the other or if there's two different worlds and you have to think about them differently because um, the processes are going to be different so that's still what we're talking with with Scott and Phil Foster from Pinnacle Farm and other organic farmers here in California trying to figure it out yeah. Um, and it may be that because it is a desert agriculture or a very dry agriculture, that adding water the way we do is, um, creates a whole different dynamic. There's just a lot of questions. And again, it's very humbling. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that I heard from every farm that I visited this time was water. Yeah. Because there's less of it. Yeah. So um, it sounds like there are going to have to be new strategies for how to grow in any case if this is a, a, a taste of the future. Yeah, yeah we had um, our normal rainfall here somewhere around 30 inches here in uh, kind of, we're in mid-central California near, not too far from Sacramento. 
And uh, we had six inches last year. And that was on top of the dry year that was the previous dry year. We've never had um, a March where you put your shovel in the ground and, and four inches down, it's, it's dry. I mean, bone dry. Because it's been, it's been the irrigation, last irrigation that you applied last year. That is, is what's the only residual moisture there. So the strategies of resilience for organic farmers are, you know, keep adding organic matter, keep your soil covered. You know, when you can put living roots in the soil, um, harvest as much sunlight as you can, you know, because that's through, through, through plant material. It's, it's, and and uh, those strategies, I think there's a universality to it. Um, and it's part of a strategy for resilience when your water's short. Um, keeping your ground cover. We like to think we could, down in the future, grow our mulches in place, the cover for our ground to, to keep the temperatures down in our soil and keep our moisture in the ground. That's our kind of our thinking that is, is um, kind of uh, driving some of the thinking about why we want to do no-till. We want to grow mulch in place and have the mulch cover the ground. And so the limited water we do have will go further, won't evaporate, but it'll be protected by a mulch. Yeah. But there's a number of steps there that we're still working out the equipment and the, and the timing and all of those pieces. But uh, yes, water is um, something. What did Mark Twain said? Uh, Whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting over here in California. <laughs> and it's really true. Yeah. It's, it's going to be where we will determine right now. It's, we're determining that uh, agriculture with the senior, most senior rights in California are having those rights suspended. Um, so that our urban areas and our river systems will have enough water. This you know amazing thing that you have to have enough water going out into the Bay Delta system, or salt water will move into, yeah. um, up into the delta, and that's where a lot of drinking water for um, the uh, San, uh, San Francisco Bay Area comes from, is out of the delta system. So um, there are ecolo ecological and economic prerogatives that have to be thought about here as farmers um, are they have in the, been in the pattern of having plenty of water. It's just not there right now. So, so we're adjusting our strategies too. Yeah. Well, last thoughts that you might have that you'd like to share? Um, you know, no, I, I, I do think it's, it's uh, for if, if there's consumers listening, if you are someone who purchases organic produce, um, you need to invest a little bit more. You just need to say, um, just buying organic produce is one step, but it's not enough. You are active in creating the food system that you want to have and what you want to be eating and what you want your kids to eat down the road. So purchasing locally, find, finding farms you can support, creating a network of information so others are doing that. You're the ones who are active in helping this movement um, maintain vigor and keeping those small farmers in, in place. Um, you're the ones who may be important in, in talking to Dan about, about their, um, their choice to leave those farm, farmers hanging up there in the, in the uh, Northeast um, or in Wisconsin or wherever they're making that choice. Um, um, it will happen. Farmers making protests need to be joined by consumers who are perceptive enough to understand that they are creating the food system that they want to have in the future. And, and for farmers, it's, it's time to um, realize we can't allow just our certifiers to say, hey, we got it taken care of. You know, we're going to the NOP meetings or, um, you know, or the NOSB meetings and, and uh, um, we're doing a little lobbying for us. Don't worry, we've got you covered. You've got to pay attention to what their, where, where their push is and, and what they support. Um, um, because they can't be without criticism. They have to reflect the the, the needs of a constituency um, that hopefully is built on equity and some level of justice and some social justice that uh, makes it a big tent where you especially favor the small growers, the people of lesser means. The, you, you focus your attention on making them viable. So uh, farmers need to be active. They need to find their community and the community needs to find them. And they need to spread that network of, of trusted relationships out a bit because it's um, it, a movement is truly is a lot of pieces that come together and it requires um, a bit of work. Yeah. You're not resting on your laurels or something that seems like it's working okay so you don't have to pay attention to it. Right. Tender loving care. That's right. 
Paul Muller uh, at Full Belly Farm, thank you very much. Sure. It's been uh, a real pleasure to visit, not just right now, but, uh -huh. but for the last five days in and out. So thank you so much. Well, David, thank you for what you do. And, and uh, you know, I don't know if people know that you're, this, you're a volunteer in all this and you're doing it driven by passion and a sense of justice. And we're, you're, things you need to see created in a food system are things you believe in. And so you're helping a lot of us be, become more active and believe in this effort. So thank you. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you will subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a rating and review. A video version of this interview, as well as the full transcript, with links related to today's conversation, is found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 62. Please join us next time when our guest is Earl Ransom of Stratford Organic Creamery, one of Vermont's few on-farm creameries who fills, packages, and direct markets their own line of dairy products. To support this podcast and the work of The Real Organic Project, subscribe to our Real Friends program at realorganicproject.org. If you join before the end of April, you can meet Paul Hawken himself at our monthly book club for our Real Friends. I learned so much from last month's meeting with Elliot Coleman. Thanks for listening and see you next time.